Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. So let's get started. Of course, in the comments below, let me know your pick of the week, because at the end of the episode, we do the viewer's pick of the week. And also, I do have my Kickstarter for The Dancer officially up. It's about a young woman who's a dancer slash assassin, and when she was little, she witnessed her parents being murdered in front of her and never dealt with that trauma until now. Hopefully, you guys could go check out the Kickstarter starter that'd be greatly appreciated but let's jump into this week's comics i had about nine books this week which is a, a bit of a smaller haul for me so jumping into number nine which was definitely one of the bigger titles this week and that is justice league issue 59 so justice league you know brian michael bendis david marquez i am a very big fan of david marquez's artwork and you know i haven't uh, been able to connect to brian michael bendis's DC work for for the most part except Naomi which I really really enjoyed Naomi but and I also haven't really been reading Justice League in a while uh so this is definitely just jumping in seeing what's going on and it was very much a an action heavy issue where we get to see the old Justice League so like the Scott Snyder Justice League or whoever took over Justice League after him uh that version of the Justice League team up with Black Adam and then by the end you get little glimpses of where the team's going, Naomi shows up, Green Arrow, Black Canary shows up, but there's not much movement of story at all. It all feels very stagnant, and I feel like the, the, panel, the panel time and even the character interactions don't really go anywhere. Uh, even though maybe they're fun little one-off stories, it, it doesn't really drive a plot, especially for a first issue like this. The action was really good, though, so it's kind of hard to rate this because, again, the artwork is gorgeous for this book. But I don't know if I'm going to stick around with this book. I, I do think I'll get the next issue, see where that one goes. But after that, will I stick around for Justice League? I am not sure, even though I do like Naomi and I want to see what's up with her. And then you have Justice League Dark that is the ending uh, story here, which I'm also not a huge Justice League Dark fan, so you're paying an extra dollar for that. So uh, definitely gonna have to weigh the odds with issue 60. So I'm giving that one two and a half stars, and that is number nine. All right, moving on to number eight, which is King in Black Spidey, issue one, which uh, was a fun one-off. It, it, it's uh, exactly that. It, it was a tie-in to King in Black and, and was a one-shot to King in Black. And it felt like a... a, a prequel slash preview scene to Reptil, which is a new miniseries coming out by the same writer. And I didn't know how to feel about that. They've definitely been pushing Reptil to be an important character, and I hope he is, and, and you know, I, I hope I feel connected to the character. But I don't really necessarily think we need a whole $4.99 issue of the Spider-Man book to just preview his book and, and say how, how awesome of a character he is over here, even though I, I didn't really feel that. You know, he, I didn't really feel his personality that much here. I like the artwork a lot, though. I thought the action was really good, especially connecting to King in Black. I like the guilt that came from Spider-Man and using that as a theme of the book. There was a lot of Staten Island references, which was fun. Uh, so overall, it was a very okay issue. I don't think you need to spend the $4.99 on it, but if you want to get a little bit of a preview of Reptile, check it out, I guess. You know, it wasn't a bad story. It just it kind of felt fillerish and, and maybe not totally necessary to the main event, which has been slightly delayed as well. So giving that three stars, and that is number eight. Moving on to number seven, which is Spider-Woman issue 10. And, and this one is the, the last chapter of this clone arc before getting into the old costume again. And I've been getting a little tired of this arc, so I'm kind of glad that it's ending. I didn't love the clone arc, but I like the ending. I like, you know, obviously Jessica... Uh, being friends with their friends again and, and meeting up with Roger and her son. So I like the later pages of this issue more than the actual main plot. But there's a lot of promise to getting the new suit or the old suit and, and a lot of great fun little quips along the way, which I enjoyed. And the artwork is pretty solid for the book as well. I do think the colors are a little damp at times. Uh, but overall, I like the ending. I like the promise to it, even if I didn't love this arc. So I'm giving that three stars and that is number... I think that's already seven, so that's kind of crazy. We're going to number six now, which is Erratic, issue four. 
And this is, I'm always so torn with this book. I do want to finish it off, see where it goes. There's only one more issue left. And I feel like this book has so much promise to not be genetic. Uh, uh, I was going to say genetic. Uh, generic. And, you know, I, I feel like it always hits the, the mark of, okay, so what does this book want to be? How is it different from anything else? And really the thing I enjoy about the book is probably the artwork. I really like the art, but everyone else kind of feels a little stale to me. The main character is very Peter Parker-esque character, but honestly with less personality in my opinion. Then you have this kind of blonde love interest who is exactly that. Okay, she knows how to punch someone, but that's about it. And she doesn't have much personality. She feels a little flip-floppy to me of like, oh, first she wants to kind of be famous on social media, and then she really likes this guy, even though she doesn't want to like this guy. So there's no one to really grab onto in my opinion. I do want to see where the last issue goes and if this will get a second volume. And again, the artwork is so good for this book. And, and it's the writer and the artist is the same person, uh, but I, I, I want to like this book so much more than I do, sadly. So I'm giving that one three stars. It wasn't a bad story. It just, uh, I think it could be even greater than, than it is. So giving that three stars, and that is number six. Moving on to number five, which is Iron Man issue seven. And this was a, a, a very biblical issue actually so you know we even have this whole entire scene with the b-list team saying well in a world with with thor and 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 all these godlike people and and gods in general who's god does you know you know what's the bigger sense of religion within in this marvel universe and i thought that was really cool and then it does tie into the main villain who wants to create this utopia and becomes kind of this godlike creature and obviously puts patsy and iron man in harm's way and you know i do think it's a little slower of an issue i think there was a lot of explaining and, and a lot of exposition in this issue but i like the overall theme of this issue and I love Patsy. I love what they're doing with her and digging into her past and even her connection to Tony. Uh, I enjoyed this. I don't know if War Machine did as much as he could have in this one because they are definitely hyping him up to be in this issue. Uh, the artwork is for Cafu is so good, so gritty and emotional, and, and I love the detail for the art. Uh, so I've been really enjoying this series. Even if this issue is a little slower, it still was an, a good installment. So giving that three and a half stars, and that is number five. Moving on to number four, which is Thor, issue 13. And this is Jane getting Odin and saying, hey, get off your ass and help us out. And it's pretty much all the Asgard people, uh, characters, fighting against against Blake, Donald Blake. And we get to see, like, this uh, kind of newly formed Thor, and, and it definitely builds up to an epic final battle between everyone that Donald Blake has been trying to harm. And I liked it. I thought there were some good emotional beats between Odin and and Jane, and I love that Jane's in this book now. We get to see uh, Throg is back. You know, I think that everyone gets a time to shine, and it's a good build-up issue. But it is that. It's a point A to point B issue. It's like, okay, how do we get everyone on the battleground? Here they are. You know, it, it's not much more than that, but it, it was a good way to do a point A to point B issue with some beautiful art and, and great action and, and, and big set pieces in this one. So giving that three and a half stars, and that is number four. Moving on to number three, which is Radiant Black issue two. I've been loving this series. And honestly, the comparison of Invincible is a perfect comparison. And, and not even in the, the, the mindset of that he's like Mark. He, I don't feel like the main character is totally like Mark. I think in the mindset of like, okay, I've seen superhero stories before. How do you make it you know, unique. How do you how do you build your own world and your own morals and, and all that fun jazz? And I think Radiant Black does a great job of that, especially in a point of view of a writer. If you're a writer, I think there's a lot of things that happen here that you could relate to in some shape or form. And I, I think that's beautiful because a lot of writers tend not to write about writing, right? Uh, because maybe it's like, oh, will everyone be able to, you know, uh, relate to that? And, and you just don't get to see it as, as often. And I think that that Kyle does such a beautiful job at showcasing writing uh, and and uh, the feelings towards writing and, and business and, and how that's all connected. So I really like that. And also you get to see this kind of Peter Parker-esque uh, moral compass of our our main character needs money, right? He he wants to write and in a perfect world, he can write and, and try to build his career up. But also he needs to get paid. He needs to have a job. So 
He's trying to figure that all out. And, you know, he has an opportunity to steal all this money, and he doesn't. He 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 gives it back to the cops who are now also kind of involved in his superhero life. So I don't know if there will be much of a secret identity. But I thought it was a really cool issue. You also build up the, the relationship between the main character and his parents, especially his dad. Uh, and there's just so many great small moments that build a, a greater world from character building to... Uh, plot to world building with this other villain red hero or not hero a villain uh and and not really knowing much about him and are there others besides these two as well because if it's like power rangers then that we know that there's there's more to the team than two people and will these people be a team probably not or is it arch nemesis versus hero uh what's their dynamic going to be about because we really don't know anything about this red guy uh so i really enjoyed this issue i've been really really liking this book i love the saturday morning cartoon vibe of the artwork as well uh and it's just kind of mind-blowing this book and i can't wait to see where it goes once the world is built even further so giving that four stars and that is number three Moving on to number two, man oh man, I love this issue, and that was Captain Marvel issue 27. So this is following the future storyline, and you know, I think it would have been easy to just do a filler issue, right? Because you need to slow things down and be like, okay, we just had a big event, let's let's just make a filler issue. And uh, Kelly Thompson doesn't do that here. You know, in, in some regards, I guess, quote unquote, you could call this a filler issue. But I do think things do happen in this one. Um, I don't, I always hate when, like, uh, when you have a quote unquote filler issue that means a bad thing. It doesn't. It means that you just need to catch your breath sometimes and slow things down and, and really delve into character. I think it's always a good opportunity to delve into character, which is exactly what this issue does. And um, even further, it, it delves into addiction. So obviously, uh, Carol is an alcoholic, and, and we get to see after this trauma she's gone through, breaking up with her boyfriend, seeing this d d demented future, all she wants to do is drink. And it's not, it, you know, I think there would have been an easy way of doing this and just the whole book, just her staring at a, at, at a shot glass or whatever and just continuing to talk about it. But I, her addiction is used in metaphors here of, okay, she's addicted to, or, you know, I wouldn't she's addicted to fighting she's that she's addicting to uh getting her mind off of everything and and that's something we get to see or we we get to see her depressed and and not being able to leave her apartment for over a week and and we get to see how she's dealing with that and it all leads up to the bottle it all leads up to people thinking that she's gonna drink and and her being kind of paranoid that people are thinking about it and then her meeting up with dr strange of all people and, and being able to relate to him and then they, they, they have a kind of a fling and and will it be more than a rebound obviously we'll find out but i thought that was a really interesting uh story i liked how they built up to it and a very uh, um, unique balance, a, a unique uh, pairing, I should say. Uh, we don't really get to see those two interact very often, so I'm very curious to see where that relationship's gonna go, but also we know that maybe Carol will be delving into some magic because of this as well. Uh, so I really liked it. I really thought it was built up very nicely and there's a lot of great character progression here, but also not forgetting the events of this uh, of this bigger arc from, from our last arc. Also, we got David Lopez back on art artwork, which has been great. I, I love his facial expressions and there's a lot of great character moments to enjoy, um, even from a humor side of seeing Carol interact with Spider-Woman and, and some of our other friends as well. Uh, so it was just a really well-balanced issue for me. So I'm giving that four and a half stars and that is number two. Moving on to number one, and that is Nightwing issue 78. I've been so excited for this book. I haven't read Nightwing in a little while just because of the whole Rick Grayson stuff wasn't really my thing. Uh, obviously, Nightwing has been in other books and I've seen him there. And it was nice to just jump in and, and not... Uh, feel grappled to previous stories that he's been uh, dealing with. It, it feels like a fresh start. And I loved it. We get to see this uh, interesting uh, backstory or, or flashback of Barbara and Dick Grayson trying to save this, this guy from a bully. Uh, and it all kind of leads up to who is Dick Grayson? Who's his character? And uh, and we get to see by the end, Alfred was a rich guy and, and left some money to Dick Grayson uh, to better himself and better the world. And it just really showed Dick's character so well from, again, from that flashback to him 
saving a dog. And it, it was just such a well-balanced issue. And I, I loved how character-driven this was. But again, there are some really great plot points as well. A lot of kind of big moments and, and even sentimental, uh, sentimental moments with Alfred's will here. And then we get to see Barbara twice in the flashback and in the present. So it's building this really interesting world at the same time, especially with the villain and seeing Bloodhaven uh, become grittier and and since Dick Grayson wasn't Dick Grayson where Bloodhaven has been at and how much work Dick Grayson has to do um and the artwork is so good for this book from the action double page spread of of Dick Grayson jumping from rooftop to rooftop to the more emotional moments where Alfred calls Dick Grayson uh the, his son and in and, and it's just so well balanced and obviously these two creators have worked together a lot and and that was seamless here and it was just a such a well done first issue and i can't wait to, to read more and see where where this run goes i'm so excited so i'm giving that four and a half stars that's my pick of the week let me know in the comments below what was your pick of the week so i'm jumping into the the viewers pick of the week from from last week it was the joker issue one and here are some comments about that. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic Uno. Definitely follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Go check out my comics like Father Light Daughter and They Call Her a Dancer. And every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time is Comic Book Weekly, where we discuss our favorite comics and comic book news. Thanks, guys. Bye.